Thailand, you can get an endless supply of the latest computer software, nearly all of it pirated. Halfway across the world in Brazil, different marketplace, same story. Street vendors openly selling pirated DVDs and software from makeshift top Holland stores. Software piracy is so common that the vendors barely take any notice of the police patrols. As soon as they've turned the corner, they set their stalls up again. Supply meets demand in countries where the average office worker would have to work for more than a month to be able to legally afford basic software. The World Summit for the Information Society in Tunisia, a global meeting of key decision makers in IT or information technology from around the globe, promoting their wares, exchanging ideas and trying to change the world. They have one thing in common with the software pirates. For just as the pirates are illegally making software affordable, the UN Secretary General and many of the delegates here also want to make the software affordable for the digitally deprived, but legally. Technological visionary Nicholas Negroponte's $100 laptop aims to put affordable computing technology in the hands of millions of schoolchildren in the most needed parts of the world. And the software that's going to be used on this? We've chosen free and open software because it's better and because it means that the children can actually participate in making the software even better over time. We believe completely in community developed software as well as content. Free and open source software, or FOSS, is the latest phenomena in computing and is causing turbulence in the proprietary or commercial software world. Widely used software, such as Thunderbird and OpenOffice, can be downloaded legally and used by anyone without having to pay for it. Over 90% of all the world's desktop and laptop computers run on proprietary software, such as Apple or Microsoft cells. Do they see open source as a threat? I think the challenge it presents to Microsoft is it just reminds us that customers do have choice. And that when you're reminded that customers have choice, and we always need to be reminded of that, it reminds us that they have to go back to work, you have to listen to your customers. You have to invest the $6 billion of R&D that we'll invest this year in ways that are going to meet the needs of those customers. So is open source the bridge for the now famous digital divide? Will innovations such as the $100 computer working on free, unlicensed software bring a billion extra users online? In the Code Breakers, we find out if open source is all it's cracked up to be. And can it be the bridge for the digital divide? One can consider open source software a lot like generic drugs. The analogy fits. In the case of open source software, it's a lot less expensive. And for that reason, it's essentially the same product. It does the same thing on a computer, but it costs less. There are estimated to be over 100,000 open source projects being developed. Not one cent was paid by the computer users who have downloaded 50 million copies of the Firefox browser from the internet. It was developed from Netscape by the non-profit Mozilla Foundation. It now has a 20% share of the European and a 14% share of the US market. Apache, the open source web server software, is used by more than 60% of all websites on the internet, including web giants Google and Amazon. So is a revolution underway? Are the days of proprietary software numbered? And now that software has become free and open, will the digital chasm between the poor and rich be closed? Only middle-aged academics will remember that more than two decades ago, when computers first reached universities, software source code was freely passed around and programmers expected to be paid for programming and not for the programs themselves. Then things changed as computers reached the business world and companies began to develop and license software on a commercial basis, restricting access to the source code. In 1984, Richard Stallman, one of the original computer whiz questioned the commercial software company's actions and started what he called the free software movement. What could I do? I had no political party behind me. I couldn't expect to convince governments or corporations to change any of their policies. 
but I did know how to write software. So I said, I'm going to develop another operating system and with the help of whoever will join in, and together we will make it free software. We will respect your freedom. Richard Stallman came up with his own license for free software, which incorporated what he described as the four freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one, the freedom to help yourself. That's the freedom to study the source code and change it to do what you wish. Then there's freedom two, the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to make copies and distribute them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to help your community. That's the freedom to publish or distribute a modified version when you wish. If you have all, four, all four of these freedoms, essential freedoms, the program is free, free software. software. Free software. Free software. The next development came in 1991. A 21-year-old Finnish computer programmer, Linus Torvalds, developed what is known as the kernel, the core of the operating system, and called it Linux. Its proponents boast it can operate as well on a mobile phone as on a supercomputer. And Torvald's invention can be downloaded without paying anyone anything. According to the Linux Counter, a pro-open source website, there are estimated to be up to 29 million computers using Linux. But since it is not sold, there are no sales figures on which to base data. I haven't heard of FOSS at all. No, I've never heard of FOSS. I'm afraid I've no idea what FOSS is. I have heard of free and open software. <laughs> uh, no, never heard of FOSS. No, I, I've never heard of FOSS. I, I don't know what it is. I've never heard of FOSS. I do not know what, what was it? Yes, I have heard of free and open source software, and uh, I do have some of those products on my computer at the moment. Free open source software may not be known by name, but indirectly, anyone who sends an email or uses the web is using open source all the time as the gears of the internet. Web servers, mail transports, and FTP servers are nearly all open source. Although Richard Stallman meant free as in freedom, not free as in no costs involved, it was misleading. Not everyone understood the concept. Especially, as we'll discover, open source can have significant costs down the line. In 1998, the Open Source Initiative, an organization dedicated to promoting free and open source software, was founded by computer programmers Eric Raymond and Bruce Perrins, who felt that the word free could be replaced by open, and that would avoid confusion. Open source takes free software and promotes it to business people. When you say free, it doesn't mean freedom, it means cheap. And that didn't play too well to business people. So by rebranding free software as open, Bruce Perrins and his colleagues hoped that a new business model would emerge. And companies like Fortune 500 Computer Hardware and software developer Sun Microsystems are now making money by selling services instead of software. What we're actually doing is we are selling our skill in producing the software that people have installed. So actually we're selling exactly the same thing we used to sell when we sold glossy boxes that people paid for at the point of selection. But the proprietary software companies argue that customers want simpler solutions out of the box. Most of the customers that I talk to uh, are looking to reduce the amount of money they spend on services. They want software to be automated, to become more simple, to be, become less complex to run. So does that mean free open source software is being hyped unjustifiably? Not necessarily, because if you live in a country with a huge potential pool of software engineers whose charges are modest, the lure of software that does not incur the cost of servicing is less obvious. It's not 100% certain that open source is truly less expensive than proprietary software, but certainly initially it is. And a quick scan of the pricing of, say, Microsoft products versus Linux products, it's simple, it's no contest. Open source is much less expensive. For that reason, if we're going to bring the world online, the one, next one billion people, clearly it's going to take open source software, or certainly a different pricing strategy by the proprietary software vendors. There are 500 million people on the African continent under 25. 
In sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, 98% of African schoolchildren go through their whole school education without ever seeing or touching a computer in the classroom. Schoolnet Namibia, set up in 1999 by a partnership of NGOs and the Ministry of Education, is a non-profit provider of internet, hardware and software to the nation's schools. It has a mission to ensure Namibians do not suffer from the handicap of being on the wrong side of the digital divide. Schoolnet is furnishing schools with specially designed computer labs equipped with donated computers. Often, the local arms of the proprietary companies will provide their software unlicensed or at reduced cost for good causes such as Schoolnet. Yet it chose open source software for the computers now in over 400 schools. Why? In having an open source solution, the way we put it into play at schools in Namibia, as part of a very standardized system, uniformly spread out across the country, we don't have viruses, we don't have people um, vandalizing or stealing software or, or whatever it is that, that, that is probably faced in, in quite a few first world you know, environments. Schoolnet claims that the accessibility of open source also means that trainees are able to learn how to refurbish computers, often with little or no knowledge of computing. Most of these people, they are not satisfied. It's like when we get to them, they are really totally irritated from computers. Open source helped us because we are not satisfied, so it helped us to make sure that we develop ourselves. Courtesy of wireless networking, schools are getting linked to the web. In the remote areas, solar provides the power. At the computing center at HQ in the capital, Windhoek, school children queue for up to an hour after school to use the free access to computers and the internet. In Brazil, the pattern of usage in the home and in the private sector is little different from anywhere else in the globe. But the switch in the governmental sector is on an altogether bigger scale. A major company such as Intel has begun to adjust its strategy. Intel's been very active in free and open source software, mainly driven by what our customer demand has been. We see this predominantly in the emerging geographies in areas like India, China, Brazil, each of these have chosen positions around open source and education, and we've been working hard to optimize our platforms for specific solutions based on open source. The Brazilian position on software, on free software, is very positive. The Brazilian government is, has created a program to support free software both inside the government as, a, as, a, as an application for uh, governmental procedures and also supporting free software as a tool, as an instrument for the society. By adopting open source, or software libre, as it's known in Brazil, the National Institute for Information Technology claims it's made a saving of around $150 million a year in license fees. And according to Gilberto Gil, this saving has been translated into more hardware reaching many previously technologically impoverished areas. There is even a government mandate now in Brazil that states that free open source software must be the software of preference by all administrative bodies. Microsoft announced the launch recently in Brazil of a simpler to operate and cheaper version of Windows XP. Is this because it's fearful that Brazil will set a very costly, for Microsoft, trend? Brazil is a very important country in the world. It's, we actually have a very focused strategy within the, the, our company around what we call the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And all of those are countries that have a wide diversity of needs. There's a very poor population in Brazil that needs access to technology, that needs to be able to get skills training to become part of the growing economy to get that first rung on the ladder. And we're very active in Brazil, working in the education sector, partnering with the government, partnering with the NGO community to make sure that that access is available. We've invested $13 million in just the last few years to provide access to technology in Brazil. But this hasn't stopped FOSS gaining a significant presence in Brazil. Projects include Paraná State's 200 million World Bank supported project that aims to provide computing infrastructure 
as well as delivering software content and support tools to 2,100 public schools. 40,000 computers have recently been delivered to distribution centres destined for the new school computer labs that will be running a specially developed web portal which gives access to learning tools through a two-way gateway where teachers log in and contribute to the pool of educational resources so software isn't the only thing that's being shared. I think the freedom is the, the most important thing because you can use, you can uh, uh, make some modifications and uh, any person can use these modifications. So uh, we live today in a, in a, in a kind of society with which one which uh, the, the knowledge is for everybody and not for our little groups who have money to pay uh, for the information. In other parts of the globe, the doors to the world of information technology are being opened in a different way. South Africa's President Mbeki is famous for his addiction to the internet. He wants the country to follow suit, with the government pushing the adoption of the digital revolution. Even an entire television series has been devoted to open source software, and the government-funded Maraca Institute has spawned many open source projects, including the Digital Doorway, which its proponents say is a virtually indestructible computing hub, which follows the, if you build it, they will come philosophy. In India, uh, there was the idea of a hole in the wall project uh, where a computer would be put, uh, where people could access it uh, kind of off the wall. Uh, it's just sitting there and it peeps through the wall and the idea is to promote the concept of minimally invasive education. Uh, that has inspired South Africa's Digital Doe project and it has now been rolled out across 21 sites. It's a way of making it easy for people to teach themselves at their own pace, again, according to their own style, uh, how to use and to innovate through information and communication technologies. The digital doorway is loaded with open source software, learning resources, an open source encyclopedia, digital books, graphic packages, and educational games. This computing kiosk, equipped with four protected screens and waterproof keyboards, not only provides access, but its supporters say quickly demystifies and makes accessible technology. Well, in many of the communities, you'll find that most of the community has not even discovered um, how a computer works. Uh, very few actually in the, in the very poor areas have access even to an ATM, let alone a computer that they can use. So for, for some of these places, this is actually the first experience any of the, the children especially have had. With, with a computer and so it's both an exciting opportunity for them to, to discover something new and also we find that in the long run they'll be learning um, about something that they're going to be using probably in, in jobs and in the workplace in the future so it, it is a real benefit to them. Projects like the Digital Doorway may be a step forward for the technologically impoverished communities but on the job front, especially in developed countries, commercial software is still much more prevalent in people's minds. I think you should have knowledge of Word, Excel, Word, Outlook, Microsoft Word and Excel. Explorer seems to be the most common. iMovie. I use Microsoft Word more than anything else. It's definitely useful to have a knowledge of Word and Excel. I think it's important that anybody has a, an understanding of that software because it's really the de facto software in the workplace nowadays. Frankly, that's really the only one that I know. <laughs> But that doesn't mean some of the big hitters are dismissing FOSS as software for the geeks. HP's position is very simple, that we give the customer a choice. If the customer wants to use proprietary software, we are very happy to give him that. And if the customer wants to use open source software, we give him that. And we work with the open source community in a very big way. In February 2005, computer giant IBM announced plans to invest 100 million US dollars in its support of open source software. Our commitment has increased to open source software. We're involved in over 150 open source projects. In our Linux Technology Center, we've got over 700 programmers and engineers working on open source projects as part of the open source community. But I think the main reason that our commitment to open source has increased is our customers have been asking for it because they see the value in it. 
And even though the majority of computers in the United Nations aren't running FOSS, the UN Joint Inspection Unit highly recommends its use. One of the recommendations we are making precisely is to ensure that all organizations in the UN system will come up with a organization-wide policy on using open source software. This is no ordinary school bus in India. This bus's seats are equipped with a computer terminal and the ticket collector has been replaced by a technologically literate teacher. This is the mobile bus project in the Baramati district of central India, where scarce resources are being made to go further than ever before. The scheme is funded by the World Bank and the Vidya Pratishan's Institute of Information Technology located in Baramati. The school children wait eagerly for the bus's arrival. The fleet of five buses travel to around 35 villages each week, are fully equipped with 24 computer terminals running free open source software, which the institute says was chosen because of initial cost savings. In India, basically, if we want to run the projects like mobile computer lab or giving computer education to rural school children, the basic constraint is the finance. And in order to get this, definitely we should find out how to reduce the cost of the project. And as the open source is the best solution to reduce the cost of the software, so we decided to go for open source platform. The mobile teachers are able to teach computing skills to 6,000 10 to 14 year old pupils. The mobile bus curriculum teaches everything from the basics of computing to how to use various kinds of software and even programming skills and it appears that this access is having even wider benefits. Apart from this computer education their general knowledge has increased, their subject knowledge has increased, they, they have, interest gets generated so that they have started coming to schools. By being used in programs like this, proponents of FOSS say this is how it will help bridge the digital divide. Advocates of open source software as a boon for developing countries also contend it is highly flexible and sometimes best suited to help cope with large scale issues like disasters. Natural disasters like the tsunami leave a massive scale of devastation in a very short space of time, swiftly wiping out transport, communications and emergency services infrastructures and even the richest nations are surprisingly left in a state of chaos. Over 30,000 people died and nearly a million people were affected by the tsunami in Sri Lanka and help and aid poured in from around the globe in the form of donations, food, clothes, money and people. All of this had to be coordinated in order that help effectively reached those who needed it most. And this needed to be done in an infrastructure that had received very little in terms of investment prior to the disaster. A vital part of disaster management is information. Who has been affected, where the people are, who needs help. And by accurately managing information using information technology, data can be processed enabling families and next of kin to find each other and resources to be distributed to those who need them most. The morning of the 26th of December was a terrible day for us uh, because uh, all of a sudden we faced, the whole of Sri Lanka faced something that had never been uh, that situation in Sri Lanka. We had losses of people, people who were not traceable, people who were injured, and, of course, for every one person, there was a whole family back at home looking for them and trying to find information. Looking at the urgent needs that had been created following the tsunami, the Sahana Disaster Management System was developed by a team of over 80 Sri Lankan programmers using free and open source software. After the tsunami, a group of volunteers from the IT industry, uh, really the free and open source community, got together and built a solution and a suite of web-based disaster management applications. They looked at the problems affecting their fellow countrymen and all the chaos, and they'd identify those problems and build solutions around them. FOSS worked for the improvised Sahana because the volunteer computer programmers needed the software urgently. It could sidestep red tape and download the products from the internet instantly without paying for anything. So Sahana claims that FOSS increases the agility of institutions working in disaster management. When we started on Sahana, we had no money as such to go and purchase off-the-shelf software. 
uh, we also had a problem uh, that we needed to tailor make them and then we had to get at the uh, get at something more than the commercial product we need to go into it with open source all those problems were not there so a locally adapted disaster management system using free and open source software was built without needing to pay for license fees the key advantage was having instant access to the source code Hood free and open source software, connecting farmers and food producers with buyers through the World Wide Web, be another step towards bridging the digital divide. Throughout the world, small and medium scale farmers have to get their goods to market via middlemen. In Malaysia, free and open source software is helping them to avoid the intermediaries. AgriBazaar, an online marketing tool for small to medium enterprises to market their products locally as well as globally, was created using open source software. It's made by a government research and development organization called MIMOS that's supported by the Agriculture Ministry, who claims that by using FOSS, it saved money on the total cost of ownership. In other words, all the costs associated with the project. We could have used proprietary software to develop AgriBazaar, but it would cost us a higher to own the total cost of ownership. If you are using a proprietary, it would be higher than if you are using a free open source software. Mimo says the equivalent of 25,000 US dollars was saved in software licenses, and by using MySQL FOSS server software instead of the proprietary alternatives, Mimos claims that in the long term, further savings are expected by not having to pay for software upgrades in the future. AgriBazaar also helps small-scale food producers like these women. They cook and package these snacks all day. Through AgriBazaar, they're now directly connected to the buyers, enabling them to negotiate their own prices. Malaysia's digital divide is between the poor and rich, but this applies regardless of where you live. The point that has never satisfactorily been answered is the digital chicken and egg. Does being connected create wealth or is connectivity a sign of it? The provincial government of Extremadura in southwest Spain is in no doubt. Badajoz is the ancient capital of the Extremadura region. This Spanish province the size of Belgium used to be one of the most economically backward parts of Western Europe. Its telephone grid was only just completed in 1980. Now it's leapfrogged the rest of Spain with an intranet connecting the entire region. The twin challenges to connecting a scattered population of just one million were distance and money. Si asegurábamos la conectividad a todo el sistema educativo, asegurábamos la conectividad a toda la región porque hay escuelas en todos los pueblos. Nos planteamos el objetivo de poner un ordenador por cada dos alumnos. Los números que nos salían nos asustaron mucho, porque estamos hablando de unos 100.000 ordenadores, poco más, poco menos, unos 100.000 ordenadores, y claro, la primera cuestión era, para que arranquen esos ordenadores, vamos a tener que pagar del orden de los 18 20 millones de euros solo para que arranquen los ordenadores. Y ahí surgió la posibilidad de poner en marcha el software libre. Es decir, el planteamiento fue, si nosotros conseguimos que esto que hay por la red, que es el software libre, lo podamos utilizar en esos ordenadores, nos ahorraríamos pues, del orden de 20 millones de euros cuando esté puesto en marcha todo el sistema. All the new computers are running Linux, a Spanish version of Linux developed locally. According to figures released by the Regional Minister of Infrastructures and Technological Development, the use of free software cost nearly 200,000 euros in 2002 to 2003, the period of installation. 40,000 copies went to schools. The authorities claim that if they bought the proprietary software, it would have cost them about 30 million euros. The Linux team also claim that free and open source software will actually save extra Madura money by extending the useful life of its computers. Por un lado eh, había un ahorro en cuanto al software, pero por otro lado se ha hecho una inversión enorme en equipos que se pretende que se vaya amortizando a lo largo de los años en cuanto a que ese, esos equipos se podrán mantener durante más tiempo porque el sistema que utilizan es un software del cual nosotros 
respondemos y adaptamos a este hardware que tenemos, porque una de las cosas interesantes del software libre es que podemos adaptar las herramientas a nuestras necesidades en muchas ocasiones. Extremadura is also providing free training and computer literacy courses using FOSS funded by the local authorities. Various websites have evolved from the computer courses, including one with the recordings of hundreds of village church bells from around Extremadura. Apparently, by accessing the site and playing their local church bells, expats and migrant villagers, some who've moved as far away as Latin America, feel less homesick. As yet, only three of Spain's 17 other provinces have plans to follow suit, but Extremadura claims it is the only region in Europe with one computer between two students in secondary schools, and says that this is in large part thanks to the use of free and open source software. Microsoft is not yet asking for whom the bell tolls. The size of the challenge in providing access to information technology, particularly in the, in the developing world, in the education sector, is so large that I think there's room for both models. And we all have a role to play in making sure that kids have access to the tools that they need for the 21st century. Our final look at FOSS in action takes us to the far corners of the globe. The Galapagos are a set of islands off the coast of Ecuador, where once the only outside visitors were intrepid scientists, including Charles Darwin. They have not been spared the invasion of tourists, who, with the advent of cheaper air travel, have access to greater parts of the globe. But tourists mean money to the local economy. The Galapagos National Park Authority is in charge of tourism on the islands. It registered around 122,000 tourists or visitors in 2005. Of those, the majority were eco-tourists, drawn to the Galapagos for its incredible pristine environment. It's this precious untouched quality that the National Park is trying to preserve. Galapagos viene a ser un sitio de visita saturado en este momento. La necesidad de tener un manejo controlado de los sitios de visita es es para nosotros lo primordial debido a nuestras políticas de conservación. Sin un determinado manejo de los sitios de conservación nosotros no podríamos lograr conservar este sitio ni tampoco mucho menos preservarlo para las futuras generaciones. The National Park said it recently chose FOSS because of its geographical remoteness and felt they would be better served by their local software developers who were already familiar with PHP open source database software and could develop a database management system tailored to suit their needs as well as saving initial costs and license fees. It's now used by every national park department, including a giant tortoise breeding program, one of the biggest attractions for visitors to the Galapagos. Information which in the not-so-distant, uncomputerized past would have taken months to process is now at their disposal. And considering that the number of tourists increased by about 20% between 2004 and 5 to over 120,000, it's vital that this information is closely monitored to ensure the survival of the area. At the 2005 UN Summit on the Information Society in Tunisia, delegates convened to address the issue of bridging the digital divide, and free and open source software was what everyone was talking about. Today, open source is a leader in sharing knowledge to everyone's benefit. We offer one of the most effective methods yet tried to achieve the goals of this summit, a productive open source partnership that helps liberate the poor and increases the freedom, knowledge, and well-being of every person. But it's more than 20 years since Stallman started the free software movement, and the digital divide keeps getting wider. So how does the future look for FOSS? How will it fare in the evolution of software? We put these questions to the experts, including representatives of three commercial computer industry giants. Somebody said recently that a modern operating system is far more complicated in terms of the number of components it's got and the number of interactions between them than, say, a jumbo jet. And what we're finding is that, and this may be perhaps the real significance of open source, is that um, these are things that are now so complicated that even vast smart, intelligent, well-resourced companies like Microsoft are buckling under the strain. And my guess is that in relation to open source, that we may well find that for many kinds of complex software products, open source is the best way to do it. And how does IBM see the future of FOSS? 
what we've seen is that over the past few years, the adoption of Linux and open source software has accelerated. Linux is the fastest growing server operating system, growing faster than any of the other systems. Other open source software is now starting to be used and it's opening up these possibilities for collaborative innovation between IT vendors, also between IT and universities and individual developers. So it's an idea whose, whose time has come, I think. It appears that even Microsoft also now believes in getting together with the open source community. When we look at the challenges that are faced around the world, we look at the various models that are available to solve those challenges, we recognize there's room for everybody to contribute. And the open source community, again, stimulates innovation in software. It's something that, frankly, we feel very good about. It brings a lot of people into the development community. It generates a lot of innovation around software. And it's something we absolutely see as being a partnership with Microsoft. And Fortune 500 computer hardware and software developer Sun Microsystems are also using open source. I think that we're going to see more and more um, corporations and uh, even smaller businesses turning to free and open source software as their development methodology. Uh, certainly at Sun Microsystems we decided a couple of years ago that it made no sense to develop our software in secret that uh, there was much more to be gained by working with the global crowd of experts than by trying to identify who the real genii were and trying to hire them. So it would appear that there are a number of reasons why FOSS may make life easier for the digitally deprived. There are no upfront costs and therefore no need to be tempted by pirated software. Geeks and non-geeks can create virtual communities to invent new software. Service charges can be the same or steeper than for proprietary software, but in the developing world where skilled labour is relatively cheap, that is less of a problem. And the adaptability of the software also means that programmes can be written in local languages, the vast majority of which are not catered for in off-the-shelf software. Does that mean FOSS will be the bridge across the divide? No one can say for certain. But what is certain is that the evangelists for free and open source software will not stop singing its praises.